Hello and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast brought to you by the last man standing with loserpool.com. And on this season review show, my guests are firstly Mike Stavrou, who's joining me here. Mike, welcome. Cheers, Harry. It's good to be here. It's good to have a little break from Arsenal for a while, um, recharge the batteries and uh, get back into it in a couple of months. Absolutely. Absolutely. I can't deny I'm looking forward to the break myself. And also joining us via video link is Arsenal documentarian, filmmaker, uh, whatever you want to call him. He makes great Arsenal content. That's what matters. It's James Cook. James, welcome to the Chronicles, mate. How are you? I'm very well, thanks, Harry. Cheers for having me on, mate. You're welcome anytime, mate. You know that. Right, let's start off. Uh, We're going to review the season on this show, and I know there's lots to talk about, so to get this into an hour is going to be difficult, no doubt about that. But uh, I'm going to start off by getting a sort of opening statement from each of you. I want to know... Uh, how you summarise, uh, you know, this this season, Unai Emery's first season in charge. James, uh, if you want to kick us off, how would you summarise Unai Emery's first campaign as Arsenal boss? It's a tough one, Harry, because it was always going to be such a difficult task taking over from Arsene Wenger, given that he'd been at the helm for 22 years. And we all knew at the start of the season that this wasn't a one-year project, but it was a two-year project. And I think a lot of fans would have forgiven him, given the way this season has panned out. But given the way the season has concluded and the games we had in order to get top four and the, the easy it was to get it as well, I'm I'm disappointed. I've got to be honest. I'm brutally disappointed with how this season has come to a, to a head. Um, the chances we had to get top four, it looked like it was there for the taking. When we got that result away from um, away from home against Spurs in the one one draw, I honestly thought when we had those tough fixtures out the way and we had the likes of Brighton, Crystal Palace, Leicester, Wolves, etc., all to play. Weren't easy games, but games that Arsenal should have won. And the fact we haven't picked up at least three points from those games to secure a top four finish. I think it's really pitiful. And that game in the Europa League final against Chelsea was a really dismal end to what was a very underwhelming campaign. So, as I say, it was always going to be a really difficult task. But it's been, um, whilst I think there have been some improvements, it's it's not been improvement enough for me to be overly encouraged just yet. Uh, but I'm, I'm still feeling optimistic. Um, but I'm, as I say, I'm just, I'm just not happy with how this season has concluded. So an overriding feeling of disappointment. Mike, how do you see it? How do you summarise this campaign? Yeah, I have to echo uh, what James said there. Pretty much, if you look at it, it is disappointing. When you look at what position we were in and after that 22-game unbeaten run, everyone was like, we got our Arsenal back, you know. I think that was uh, that was too early to say that for me. And I was definitely looking at the games there and saying it's papered over cracks. And I think what happened towards the end of the season is uh, we focused more on the Europa League. And um, the fact that we did ultimately bottle um, the last section of the season to get into the Champions League places, which we should have done. Um, you know, with eight games to go, we were saying we're in the best position and we didn't make it. I think the fact that we had the Europa League in the background, um, which would have given us another route into the Champions League, that papered over the cracks in the sense that if we would have made it against Chelsea, all of that would have been forgotten about. And I think while people were going for that period when we drew against Brighton, when we lost against Palace... Everton, you know, Wolves, Leicester. I think if we weren't in the Europa League at that time, the reaction would have been a lot worse uh, because they would have seen at that stage we're not getting in. I think, you know, last week uh, it was so difficult to take because it was such a poor performance. And, um, you know, the Europa League specialist in our Emery couldn't even get us back into the Europa League. So it is a disappointing season, but you have to temper that with the fact that, you know, if you look across to Manchester United, who also came off the back of a very long uh, regime uh, of a very successful manager in Sir Alex Ferguson, look at where they are now. Um, six, seven years down the line, you know, terrible managers in David Moyes and Louis van Gaal and Jose Mourinho even. You know, look at who they've got in, uh, how much money they've spent, and they're worse off than we are one year into the project. So even though it is disappointing, I think we have to look at it Um, a bit objectively and say that you know it's one year in and it would improve if you know Emery is the manager to do that I don't know I mean a lot of people debate I know Harry you've got a lot of thoughts on that I'm I'm sure we'll discuss it later but um, yeah we have to look at it and give it time because ultimately uh, it's a long-term project and we're only just one year into it yeah absolutely I think to summarize for me I think I echo most of what both of you guys have said I think that the performances at times haven't been great. I think there's been a small amount of progress and, and you know, we finished on more points than we did last year. And so you can't take that away from Unai Emery. You have to give him that. But I also think that the standard of our footballs dropped. And, and I'm not talking about Wenger's last season because that was poor all round. But in terms of 
the overall football, the Arsenal brand of football has slightly disappeared for me. Um, I think that having brought in four defensive, five even defensive minded players uh, in the summer to not improve defensively is almost criminal. Um, and I can understand why perhaps those who are in charge of the club may be a little bit reluctant to give Unai Emery big money in the summer. Um, I always go back to the point that I've made all season, the fact that he was signed on a three-year deal with, an, with a clause to terminate after two tells me that maybe Unai Emery wasn't the number one choice. Uh, we've heard lots, haven't we, in the aftermath of his appointment about how he was this outstanding candidate. I'm not sure I buy that. I mean, I can't imagine the club coming out and saying, Oh, you know, we tried to get X, Y, Z, but we ended up with, with B, for example. It, it just doesn't sit well with me. Um, but, you know, ultimately, you guys are both right. The season ended in a really disappointing fashion. Our league form completely evaded us. And to lose in the Europa League final the way we did was really, really disappointing. It's not that we got beat for me. It's the way we got beat. And, you know, I know people say you don't care how you win and you're happy to win ugly. But you cannot take a team going out there and being completely battered in a second half of a game that was huge. And people would talk about the atmosphere in Baku being bad. The fact that there weren't many supporters because of the travel issues, etc. It's not a valid excuse for me. So, I mean, uh, James, how would you rank Unai Emery's first season out of 10 if you had to give him a score? Oh, that's a really tough question. Um, I think... Uh... I think I struggled to go any higher than a five. Um, I think, as I mentioned before, I was really excited at the start of this season. And I think we saw a new identity of football, especially in those opening games against Manchester City, against Chelsea, where I thought Emery was really brave to play the system that he did and to give players like Matteo Guendouzi a chance in the first time. I was really excited by how pragmatic he was and how exciting the football was that we played at times. I remember that game, one of our first away games at Fulham, and I really thought we were going to kick on from that and play that exciting, expansive football a lot more often. Unfortunately, that hasn't really been the case. Um, towards the end of the season, he does seem to have lost trust in some players. Mustafi's definitely been someone that he's lost a lot of trust in. And because of our defensive frailties, he's been sort of forced into playing this free at the back system, which is more of a five at the back a lot of the time. And I don't think he's overly keen on playing that way. I think we, we know from his time at PSG at Sevilla that he wants to play with a back four. He likes to play a 4-2-3-1. And honestly, we haven't seen that a lot this season. We've seen it at times, uh, but not enough. And even when we have played that system, I'm thinking back to games like Watford at home, like West Ham at home, where we played very poor football and we still somehow managed to get a win. And that's what encouraged me because we weren't getting those sort of results last season, even when we were playing badly. But it's, I think, recently... The poor performances have been highlighted even more by the result against Chelsea, by the result against uh, Everton, Burnley, not Burnley, um, Leicester, Wolves, that was Burnley, one of our Brighton very few wins. One. Brighton, yeah, I mean, the, the list goes on about where we played poorly and got on poor results, and individuals have really contributed to that as well. Granite Xhaka has been brought into question these past couple of months. Mustafi, um, I mean, the future of Koscielny and Monreal is looking very, very uncertain at the moment. And I think we're coming to the... The end of a tenure with a lot of some of, with a lot of these players, um, and it really is the case of turning over a new leaf. But from Embry's point of view, I do think he's he's excited me at times, but he's also disappointed me massively at times. I'm looking back to that game against Crystal Palace in particular. I'm sure we'll touch on that a little bit later, but for me, that was a real, real, real bad call on his behalf, and that's been a massive turning point in this season, and has ultimately uh, boiled down to us not finishing in the Champions League places when we have probably had one of the best opportunities in which to do it in the past five years or so. So, um, yeah, that's my take on it. For me, Unai Emery, 5 out of 10 this season. 5 out of 10. Mike, your, uh, your rating? 5 out of 10 is a bit harsh, I'd say. Um, I think... Why, though? Because I think if you would have looked at it beforehand and, you know, as I said earlier, coming off a 22-year regime and given the mess that um, the likes of uh, Ivan Gazidis left us in, you know, in terms of the, the, f the financial status, which, you know, with the higher wage bill, which meant that we couldn't spend big. Um, even if Stan Kroenke wanted to invest loads of money in, he wouldn't be able to just because of how the club structure is. Um, the fact that it's been left in such a mess. Um, you know, we've got players like Mesut Ozil on 350 grand a week, Mkhitaryan on 220 grand a week. I mean, and then Aaron Ramsey leaving on a free. I mean, I saw a stat the, the other day, um, Harry, that said we sold the likes of Alexis Sanchez, Olivier Giroud, um, Aaron Ramsey, and um, and one or two, and Jack Wilshire for a combined fee of £19.5 million. Pounds. 
I mean, we could have got £40 million alone for Aaron Ramsey, even more when you look at the performances he put in. It's an absolute mess financially. So for Unai Emery to come in off the back of that and do pretty much, I think, what we would have expected, challenge for top four and get us to the final. So I think it's about what you would have expected. I think I'll give him about a six and a half. It would, it, okay. it would have gone up to about a seven uh, if we would have won it and been back in the Champions because that would have been a good achievement. But obviously, it's a bit disappointing. Um, I think five is a little bit harsh. But on, then, I think so, so you're saying that the difference between making the Champions League and not making the Champions League is only half. So between six and a half and seven, yeah, you I wouldn't mean, bump you know, it up more, or you wouldn't start lower and bump it up more. You you think that? So, but essentially, what you're saying is that getting into the Champions League was not that big a deal because no, you're only adding half onto his score. I think it was a big deal, but if if you look at it. You know, he, he got us all the way to the final. It is one game. We were poor. But I think throughout the tournament, we played very well. I mean, look at the teams we beat. I know they weren't on top form, but the likes of Napoli, you know, came second in uh, Serie A last season, pushed Juventus all the way. Uh, Valencia, you know, they're, they're good European teams that you wouldn't probably expect to play in the Europa League. Um, and you look at uh, like how we did last season. We got smashed by Fleck, uh, Fleck coming during the semi-final. I think it's, it's around about what you would have expected. I don't think it's a massively... Um, you know, terrible job. Like, of course, we should have finished in, uh, in in the top four, and I think it's very disappointing to to not get there. But then you look at the, some of the form in the earlier part of the season, and it was very good and more than you would expect. And we were starting to play a brand of football. But um, I think about a six, a six and a half is about fair for me. What what happened to that brand of football, though, Mike? Because as James already mentioned, when Unai first came in, he was excited by the pragmatism. He was excited by the different style. In hindsight, though, were we just excited to see something different rather than something good and something positive? You know what it is? I, th I think he has a clear a clear vision of what he wants to do, but um, that wasn't implemented thoroughly enough. I think we saw you know, a start of it at the beginning, especially in the first game of the season where Czech nearly scored an own goal from, uh, from passing out of the back. Even though it was comical, I mean, you kind of saw where he was going with that. Um, that, that uh, you know, high press and... For whatever reason, towards the back end of the season, it just sort of like old habits started to creep in where um, he switched the system so much. Um, it, I think the players just really didn't have the plan nailed down, whereas they did at the beginning. I think they just kind of fell away. And I compare it to the likes of uh, Man City and Liverpool, who've got this clear philosophy and plan that they that they implement. And you, you see it in training, like Pep Guardiola uh, after the FA Cup final, where they just battered Watford. <laughs> was telling Sterling off because there's something that you saw that he didn't quite like. And that's the attention to detail that um, Unai you know, Emery hasn't quite put into the team yet. But you know with Guardiola and Klopp, they have a clear plan and a clear philosophy. And I don't think that's we haven't seen that yet from Emery. But James, my issue with Emery this season has been the lack of a clear plan, the lack of a philosophy. And I always bang on about this. And for me, the, the prime example of someone who stuck to his philosophy despite not having the team he wants, you know, completely, is Maurizio Sarri, who again was in his first season. He went in there, he implemented a style. At first it was going great. Things dropped off. Um, you know, then he stuck to his guns, despite all the criticism, despite Chelsea fans getting onto his case. And at the end of the day, he's finished third and won the Europa League and he's been to the League Cup final. Is that a, a proof in the pudding that, you know, Emery should have stuck to his game? And for me, the fact that Emery keeps moving away from his philosophy, changing formation, changing system, maybe tells me that he doesn't quite believe in what he's doing in the first place. What would you say to that, James? I think in the case of Sarri, it's really interesting that, I mean, he obviously, as you mentioned, he's, on paper he's had a great season. I think Chelsea fans would be really happy with how things have gone. They've got to the final of the League Cup, lost to City on penalties. They finished um, in the top four. They've, they've won the Europa League. On paper, that's a very good season for given where Chelsea have been in the past couple of years. Um, so they'll be delighted with that, I think. But it says a lot that he's still potentially facing losing his job and we're kind of still mulling over Unai Emery. Um, I think I, I, it's, it's a really difficult one because I think um, Sarri, as I say, I think he's done a, done a great job at Chelsea. And I think he's a bit more fortunate that he's got the players to play that 4-3-3 three, three that he wants to play because he's got natural wingers in there. He's got Hazard, he's got Pedro, he's got William, he had Hudson-Odoi. Um, Emery wants to play a similar style 4-2-3-1 but we've 
we've not got wingers, to be brutally honest. We've got Iwobi, who I don't think is a winger, to be honest. Mikatarin, who's not exactly a winger. And at the start, he was forced into playing players in those wide areas that I don't think Emery particularly wanted to play. And that's why I think we've been forced back into playing this uh, 3-4-1-2 formation. And as well, I think you've got to consider that we do have two very good strikers up top, and we've got to accommodate them both in a system that's going to work to their strengths. And I think that system, for the most part, has worked really well for them. Um, so I think that's uh, I think Emery's been sensible in that sense in terms of bringing those players into the squad and finding a system that that works for those two. Um, but as well, uh, it hasn't really been um, it hasn't really been what he initially set out with. And I think next season we'll see improvement when we see Reese Nelson come in, where we see hopefully some uh, investment in the summer. Where we can bring in another wide man. But I mean, it really does make you wonder what's going to happen with Aubameyang Lacazette because will Aubameyang be shunned out wide again where I don't think he performed that well throughout the start of the season um, will I mean one of them even be at the club come the end of the transfer window it's it, it, it's really one that's going to be up for debate but um, yeah I think uh, I think you make a great point there and I, I do think it's overly been a case of Emery's having to deal with the tools that he's got at his disposal Okay, interesting stuff. Guys, we're going to take a short break and we'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to part two of the Chronicles of Aguna's season review. I'm joined by Mike Stavrou and uh, James Cook via video link. Now, I want to talk about some some of Arsenal's individual players. There there are lots of players who are forever being criticised and rightly so. Um, you know, it's very hard to make cases to defend a lot of them uh, at times. But someone who's on everybody's lips, is, is Mesut Ozil. And I am sick to death of when having the Mesut Ozil debate, people's first comment is, but he earns 350 grand a week. Now, to me, I couldn't care less what Mesut Ozil earns. I care about his performances on the pitch. I also think that when you're talking about a club who have historically not wanted to pay the wages that some of the other big clubs have, because we can't for whatever reason... To think that Arsenal were giving him that sort of money without having any financial return from it in terms of commercial revenue, etc., I think is naive. I think that Arsenal do get a good return on Mesut Ozil and that's why he earns what he does. Mike, where are you on the Ozil debate? Would you keep him? Would you do whatever you can to offload him? There are reports floating around that Unai Emery's told the club to get rid of him. It's just reports at the moment. But what's your take on the Ozil situation? What's the solution? What do we do going forward? That's a difficult one, isn't it? I think the earlier in the, in the early part of last season, um, when he wasn't getting in the team, a lot of people have made a lot of speculation about has there been a rift between Unai Emery and Mesut Ozil. I don't think it's that. I've heard from multiple people who know others inside the club that say he literally was just a back injury, and that's the reason why. Um, do I think he's a fit at Arsenal? No. Uh, I think he's an old-school player, Harry. I don't think he suits the way that we play the game in the Premier League it's too fast, it's too physical, it doesn't suit someone like Ozil, and it doesn't suit the way that we want to play. Obviously, James mentioned earlier, if Emery had it his way, and he had the right kind of wide players, he'd play 4-3-3 or 4-2-3-1, and Ozil doesn't fit into that system, really, uh, ultimately, and if I had my choice, I would sell him, um, mostly because it would free up so much room on the wage bill, which means we could probably bring about two or three other players in. But how do you sell someone that doesn't exactly. want to leave, and that you know, yeah. if he's on a contract and nobody makes a, a reasonable offer, and even if they do make an offer that the club accept, yeah. what do you do? Because you have to convince Mesut Ozil, yeah. who's under contract, to take a pay cut. Is that going to happen? That's the issue we have. And obviously in an ideal world, you can say get rid of him, but it's not going to happen. I mean, ultimately, uh, for Ozil, he signed a massive contract. He's sitting on three, 350 grand a week. No one in Europe is, is going to pay that. The The only place I can see playing it is maybe like a China. But is Mesut Ozil going to want to leave London and his massive bumble contracts go to China? Of course he's not. I mean, it, it's, a, it's, it's a silly idea to even talk about it. So ultimately, we're stuck with him. And um, if, you, if you're stuck with him, I mean, you have to try and find a way to play him. And there are moments where Mesut Ozil is magic, but there's too many moments where he's not. And you can't have, you know, someone like that who ultimately... Um, takes a position of his own and you have to fit the whole system around him and I think Emery's in a very difficult position but um, if it was up to me and obviously in an ideal world I would sell him. James your take on the Mesut Ozil situation would you rather Aaron Ramsey had uh, signed a new deal instead? 
I think Mike summed it up brilliantly there. The Ozil situation is a massive mess that we've gotten ourselves into, a massive, massive mess. And in answer to your question, yeah, I probably would have had Aaron Ramsey because I think if we're going to play this 4-3-3, 4-2-3-1 and we want to have an attacking, pressing number 10, then Ramsey, I think he's more of a deeper line midfielder that makes likes to make those runs from deep. Um, but I think if we were going to play him that little bit higher, I think he'd have done very well there. I think he's evidenced that throughout the course of this season, whether he's been playing a bit deeper as an 8 or whether he's been playing as a 10, he's been very efficient in this team. And to let him go for free and then to have a massive financial burden in Meza Ozil, it, it's, it's such a mess. It's an unbelievable mess that the club have put themselves in. But I think as well, Mike, I think you summed it up brilliantly. Um, he has got massive marketing power and the finances that he'll be able to bring in from a sponsored Instagram post is mental. It's astronomical, the, the, the finances he can bring into the club. But as well, it creates this huge imbalance in the team because someone like Aubameyang, who's been our top scorer, I'm sure he's not on anywhere near as much money as Ozil, is going to turn around and say, OK, Ozil's on that much money. He's not contributed as much as I have. I want 400k a week. It could potentially happen. It's not something that I want to happen. I don't think anyone wants that to happen. But whilst we've got this imbalance in the wage structure, it creates that sort of that sort of discontent within the team. So I'm a little bit concerned on that front. And I do think we're really going to struggle to get rid of this guy um, this summer. And I do think he is going to eventually see out his Arsenal contract because I can't think of any team in Europe that's going to pay £350,000 a week. And he's not the sort of player that I think is going to take a pay cut anytime soon. So the only realistic proposition is China. And I think from Mazza Ozil's point of view, given that he's not even 31 yet, he's still going to think that he's got some years left at the top level. So I can't see that being a realistic possibility either. So I think we've, I don't know if we have to try and work a way for him to play in the team because I don't think just because of his wage we've got to play him. I think that would be would be silly because if it's not benefiting the side, then I don't think it makes sense to do that. And I think in that Europa League final, he really shows why we are going to struggle to have him in the, in the future um, because... As I say, he's going to be turning 31 soon and he just doesn't seem to be working in this system. I think it says a lot as well that at the start of the season he wasn't getting in the team and then he had that period out and then he came back into the side, played really well for a couple of games and everyone was saying, look what Emery's done. He was really clever to leave him out of the side, get him up to the way he wanted to play. And then having established himself back in the team again, he's gone back to the lacklustre player that we were seeing earlier on in the season it's not something I want to say about Ozil because on his day we know how fantastic he is and he's got to be one of my favourite players in the last five years or so at Arsenal um, and I think when we had Ozil, uh, Ozil, Walcott and Sanchez all in the same side in 15-16 he showed what he was capable of and he has been unfortunate in the sense that when we had those wingers he had Drury in front of him and now we've got a Bamiyang Lacazette and we've got no wingers it has been I do sympathise with him in that sense I think next season well, we've got proper wingers in the side, hopefully, fingers crossed. We've got to try and find a way to accommodate him with those players and maybe we'll see a different Mazza Ozil. If we don't, then he'll be 31 years of age and we've got to move on and we've got to find a way to get rid of this guy. But I don't think it's going to be by cutting his contract short because I think that will cost us about 35 million. So financially, that's not an option. Um, so it's, it's an absolute mess, but I don't think he's going to be going this, this anytime soon. But I struggle to see a long-term future where Mazza Ozil is a part of it. Yeah, can't can't disagree with with most of that, uh, Mike. In terms of other players that we need to ship out, I think everybody's got their opinions on this. Who needs to go? Um, so I was thinking about this a little bit. I think someone as similar to Ozil, obviously the contract isn't as high. I think it's about two hundred twenty grand. But Henrik Mkhitaryan, I think he's been such a patchy player, um, both in terms of his confidence and like mental state as well. Like I read a story about him when he was at Borussia Dortmund. And he had a few, he had a run of really bad games, right? And the the press were on his back. And what Mkhitaryan did, he held himself up in his apartment and just just wouldn't come out. I mean, is that the sort of player that, that you want in your team when you're trying to challenge, you know, uh, for, for for the top four and be, you know, mentally on it every single game? It's not. And plainly, I haven't seen enough from him to suggest that um, that he will improve in that sense. As As James said, he's not really a winger. Um, he's not really good enough to play in that number 10. So where does he fit in? And I'd much rather have someone, you know, younger, more hungry, like a Reece Nelson, who could come in. I'm not saying he's necessarily going to start every game, but I'd just prefer to see someone like that who's a bit more dynamic um, come in for Henrik Mkhitaryan. Um, elsewhere, I think Lauren Koscielny, I mean, you know, we're not going to get any money back for him, but I just think we can't continue to 
to, to play him for another season. He's put in a really, really good performance, I think, o over this season. And I laud him for that because he's been a great servant to the club. But I think it's about time to move him on. Um, obviously, I mean, everyone and their dog's going to say Skodra Mustafi. Uh, the, the bloke is just plainly not good enough to play for Arsenal Football Club. He's, he's a good defender um, for about 70 minutes. And then he'll have one killer or two, three even mistakes and that costs you a goal. And that rashness is not something that should be uh, in, a, in a defender's mindset. So I think he's another one that needs to go. Um, elsewhere, you're looking at possibly Ser Kolasinac. I mean, he's actually been one of our better attacking outlets, um, which says a lot about the lack of creativity in the team. But I think defensively, Harry, he's really shoddy. And, you know, we signed him on a free. So ultimately, we're not losing that much. If we, if, if we can try and try and ship him out, um, so those those four, Ozil, Mkhitaryan, uh, Koscielny and Kolasinac are probably the, the four names I'll give you to, to move on for me. Yeah. James, who would you be looking to move on uh, this summer? And I know this is just us talking. It's not always as easy as that. You've got to find a buyer. You've got to find someone willing to take the player on. You've got to make the player want to go. But who would you, if you were in charge of the club and you had, you know, all the power in the world, who would be your sort of three, four players that you'd like to see leave the club? Look, there, there's a load of players that I think we know evidently aren't quite good enough. And I think you've you've um, hit the nail on the head there because it's, it's not that easy. I think there are probably about eight, nine, ten players that I think a lot of Arsenal fans have come to the conclusion of that, that just don't have a future at this club. They're either not good enough, they're too old, or they're on too much money. But realistically, you're not going to get rid of ten players in one transfer window. I think the ones that generate the most revenue are probably the ones that you want to get rid of soonish so Mustafi as poor as he's been this season and as well I think I don't I don't want to be overly harsh on Mustafi because he was a big part of that 22 game winning run that we went on he did play a lot of games but it's just those rash decisions that cost us especially against Crystal Palace that's unforgivable what he did in that game he's done it a few times this season but he's not the only one that we've got to be pointing the finger at there are other ones as well that have made errors just as bad Jacker with the penalty against Brighton I mean the list goes on of players that have individually cost us games this season um, but it is a collective effort as well that should be highlighted you can only be as good as the team around you. Um, so Mustafi, I think, could generate us a, a little bit of money. I don't know how much we'd get for him. I don't think we'd see much return on our investment for him. But as well, uh, Mkhitaryan and Ozil, if we could potentially get them out of the club to free up the wage bill, that would be fantastic. And then players like Jenkinson, El Elneny, um, I think just, you know, it's time to cut sentiment with, with certain players as well. Because Shelly, Monreal, they're just getting too old. Um, I think it's just a case of freeing up the wage bill and then bringing in a little bit of money in the transfer kitty. But I don't think we're going to get anywhere near as much money as some people are anticipating from player sales. We're not going to get 70 million from player sales this summer. I'd be extremely surprised if we did. And given the evidence that we've seen from uh, previous player sales, um, Wilshire, Alexis Sanchez, um, Giroud, etc. We're, we're going to generate very little money and I don't have confidence in the people upstairs to, to get that revenue in. I don't have confidence that these players are entirely... Um, happy to leave the club so it's going to be a really sticky situation um, and it's not it's going to be a really long and drawn out summer but yeah um, I think those players that I mentioned are the ones I'd like to see leave the club as soon as possible yeah I, I think I agree with both of you I think there's a lot of players that you you could see potentially shipped out of the club whether it's as easy as that I'll make that point again I don't think it's that easy I think players that and this is a really unpopular opinion but I think that there is a player in Mustafi somewhere and I think that in the right defence, with the right partner, he could be half decent. I genuinely do believe that. I think there is a player in there somewhere. I also think that Granit Xhaka takes a lot of stick. In the right team, with the right balance, with the right partner, could be more effective than he is currently. And I think a lot of it is that we've kind of, over the years, we've been mixing and matching players without having a real long-term plan, a real idea of what it is we want to achieve. And as a result... We got lots of pieces that just don't fit together. I don't think these players are necessarily bad individuals. The fact that we paid so much money for some of them, and and what they do, um, or what they've done previously, or where they've been on the international stage. For example, Jack is the captain of Switzerland. Mustafi's won a World Cup. So what I'm trying to say is, whilst they have underperformed at Arsenal, I, I do think that they've been misused at times as well. And that's not just Unai Emery's fault. I think Arsene Wenger's guilty of the same thing as well. But I do think that we need to forget about this notion of, yep, we're going to get 30 million, 20 million from Mustafi. It's not going to happen. So either you try and get the best out of him, you try and make you know, the most of your investment, or you just say forget it and you just leave him out of the team, cut your losses and get on with it. 
And I know it's a very difficult position to be in as a club because financially the club is restricted. And I think the first sign that we saw of this whole situation that we're in was the fact that in January, when we quite clearly needed to strengthen to push on, we went and got Denis Suarez on loan. And, you know, for me, that made absolutely no sense. What did we bring him for? We brought him to Arsenal to have a holiday. Essentially, that's what Denis Suarez did at Arsenal. Absolutely nothing. And yes, he was unfortunate with injuries, but even when he was fit, he just wasn't in the team. He wasn't featured. So it makes you wonder, doesn't it? Who was it that sanctioned that deal? Who went out and got Denis Suarez? And if we're listening to sort of what Vinay and Raul have said in those videos of late, it seems that the head coach is just that, a head coach. He's not going to have the overriding say on, on who comes in, who goes out and the long-term plan. And, and Raul made the point, didn't he, over and over again that the, the head coach is short-term and the technical director and his role is, is long-term. So I think you're going to get clashes of ideology in this model and I, I, I'm not entirely sure it's the right thing. I don't know what you think of that, Mike. Yeah, I mean, that. first of all, let's just talk about that, that video in a sense. I mean, what it's, it's a load of hot air ultimately, isn't it? I mean... They they have to come out and try and improve their their image a little bit, and they have to because we've got an apathetic owner who wasn't even um, at the, the Europa League final, couldn't, couldn't even make it, uh, you know, that short trip. And you you draw the comparison to someone like John W. Henry, the owner of of Liverpool. He was pictured on the flight back with the trophy, smiling. That that's an owner who cares, and he he's got he's got an American franchise as well. I think it's the it's the Red Sox over in the U.S. I'm well, not sure about. Well, it. he can he he can manage to to to. To do both, why can't Stan Kroenke? I, I know Josh Kroenke was there as well, and uh, apparently he's been given the license to uh, to to manage sort of that side of things at Arsenal. But still, it just makes me think back to what a mess it is in the entire the entire process and structure. And I don't think we've actually sorted out our technical director yet. I think there was there was rumours of, of Edu. Uh, I, I don't know if that's been sorted out or not. But ultimately, you're getting into the stage now where those deals should be being finalised. Um, and if you've not got a technical director, who's been making the decisions of who we're going to target this summer? And obviously those targets would have taken a hit with the lack of uh, Champions League. So what's going to happen this summer? Like, Lord knows. And one thing I wanted to put to James as well is, um, you know, these players we've been chatting about getting rid of, they're not going to bring in uh, money. So let's say the, the rumours of 40, 50 million uh, minus player sales uh, for our transfer budget is correct. I mean, we're, we're not going to get anyone for that. So... Uh, some people have been saying, should we sell a Lacazette or an Aubameyang to be able to fund that? I personally would not. But um, I just wanted, Jazz, wanted to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, um, as I say, I, I, I didn't think we, we, we're going to generate much revenue from Jenks and Elneny, Mustafi, etc. I think you're looking at about 20 million max for all of those players combined. I think where you're looking at potentially getting revenue in is from someone like Kalasinac, someone like Granit Xhaka, players that... I mean, we've question marked and highlighted an awful lot. Um, and we're, we're not sure if they've got long-term futures at this club. I do think we could get quite easily something like 20 million for Kalasinac or potentially Granit Xhaka in the right system. I do think these are very good players. But if they're not going to work at Arsenal, then we should sell those players and look to bring in revenue that way. Selling one of a Bamiyang Lacazette, I think that would be, I think that'd be ludicrous. It's one of the very few positives that I think we can bring out of this season. They Their, their partnership has been extremely effective. But again, it comes back to if Emery wants to play his system and he wants to play the 4-2-3-1 or the 4-3-3, then you can't do that with those two players without shunning one of them onto the left or putting one of them on the bench. So again, it, it just all falls into this mess that we've got at Arsenal Football Club at the minute. And if we could maybe get £70 million for Lacazette, I do think, I personally wouldn't do it, but I do think Raul Sinelli, um and Emery might possibly look at that and think, OK, if that can free up some funds, if we can add to our transfer kitty, potentially we'll do that. Realistically, though, none of us know how much money Arsenal have got. Um, and we have no idea what players they're looking to sell or move on. Players we wanted to ship out, we're not going to be able to now because we're in the Europa League and we've got to face facts that so we are going to need these players to compete in that tournament as well. So someone like Mustafi that could potentially have been out in out the door, I mean, we might need him now because he might be the level of player that this club can attract, sadly. Um, but as Harry said, I think there's a good player in there. It's just if he can get rid of those rash challenges and those rash decisions he makes, I do think he would be positive. It's just... Uh, He's done that far too often. And maybe against um, alongside another powering, dominant centre-half, we might see a different player. But, I mean, it's all, it's all question marks about Arsenal at the minute. And uh, I do think that we're going to see very little revenue generated over the summer. Um, and I think we're just going to have to make do with, quite, sadly, quite a lot of what we've got at the minute. I mean, James, this, this is kind of my issue, though. You know, we, we didn't have much revenue last summer. 
we spent around about 70 odd million I think which for a club of Arsenal size is not you know this day and age is not a great deal you're not going to get a great deal for that money but we did bring in a goalkeeper we did bring in a centre back a right back a defensive midfielder yet we've not improved defensively so as the owner of the club and people will sit there and say Kroenke's not doing this Kroenke's not doing that and just quickly to touch on the point about the final did you expect him to be at the final because I didn't I mean it came as no surprise to me that he wasn't there but in terms of saying that he, you know, he he's not going to put money in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, Unai Emery had some money last summer, and the area in which he chose to spend the majority of our money was on the defence. Yet the defence has not improved. So as an owner, I would question what's gone on there. You know, I've given you money to strengthen a particular area of the team. You've chosen, or whoever's chosen, to focus the funds that we did have available on that particular part of the pitch, and we couldn't improve. So then where where does the trust, at what point as an owner or as the man calling the shots, do you turn around and say, well, I gave you money for this and it didn't work. So uh, do you see what I mean? Yeah, I see what you mean, Harry. But in this, in the same sense, when you do spend £70 million on four players, I mean, you're, you're shopping in Poundland, aren't you, ultimately? like look, I, I know we haven't got the funds of Liverpool. We're not the, the size of the club that, that they are. But just I made that comparison to John W. Henry. He gave Jurgen Klopp um, over £150 million or, or more to spend on Allison and Van Dijk, and they had the best defensive record this season. I don't think that's a coincidence. Um, and then you look at who Ebro and Socrates, who is a decent defender, but ultimately, you know, you wouldn't see him, I think, fit into any other top six side. Uh, Leno, who's a promising keeper, but again, as we've seen this season, makes mistakes. So uh, ultimately, the job was on Emery to improve that defence as a whole, and that hasn't happened. But ultimately, we we, we didn't get the players in to to um to improve that and I, I know we have players like Mustafa you say you know is a is a there's a good defender in there somewhere I mean like how far do we have to search I mean the guy you, you can't change his mentality which is ultimately the issue that he makes rash decisions you're not going to change that but what I would say to you in response to that is if we're talking about the club have gone down a route of appointing a head coach surely his job is to coach and improve as well as bringing new players, but surely part of his role is to coach and improve the players that we already have. And that hasn't happened. You know, at the beginning of the season, people were talking about Iwobi. Oh, look how good Iwobi's become this season. He improved a little bit for a period of time, in my opinion, aside from the, you know, the cameo performance in the, or appearance, sorry, in the Europa League final where he played pretty well. It's the same Iwobi that we saw the season before. I haven't seen Xhaka improve. I haven't seen Mustafi improve. I think Xhaka has improved, Harry. Uh, for me, Xhaka was benefiting earlier on in the season from having the right partner next to him, which he probably never had in his time at Arsenal before with Torreira. And then Emery chose to disrupt that period by bringing in Guendouzi, by bringing in, you know, all di all different sorts of combinations that just weren't working for me. He had the, the winning ticket, in my opinion, in Xhaka and Torreira. And had he allowed that to flourish and develop as a partnership, throughout the course of the season, then at the end of the season, we would have been in a much better position. But how many times did we see Guendouzi included instead of one of them? Did we see Ramsey dropped back into that role? But then then you ask the question of why at the start of the season, when we were struggling for experience, was Aaron Ramsey left on the bench? There are so many questions and so many things that Unai Emery's done this season that I can't get my head around. And there are many times in football where you look at something and you say, I don't particularly agree with that. But I can see why he's done it. Take the Champions League final, for example. We were talking before the game and I said I wouldn't have started Harry Kane. How fit can he be? They've done well without him up to this point. Why would you bring him in? But on the other hand, I can see why Pochettino started him. Because if he didn't and Spurs lost, everyone would have been like, well, you know, you left out Harry Kane. So uh, there are times where you can see something that you disagree with, but you get the why. And I don't get the why with a lot of what Unai's doing. Yeah, I see what you mean. And... Purely, you know, your are your ultimately your your question, Emery, where, where he's the right man. I think purely he's he's a stopgap. I think uh, at the end of that regime, we had to bring in someone who was going to stabilise us. Um, we haven't got worse. I mean, it can get bad. I mean, when you get a manager like uh, I keep going back to Man United, but you have to make the comparison. Look how poor they've become because they chose the wrong replacement in David Moyes. We we haven't done that bad. I think we've been stabilised. Is he the manager that's going to take us back up to the top? I don't think so. But I think he'll probably see out his two seasons 
and we'll go and get someone else. I think the next appointment that we make after Emery is, is the vital one. We need someone a bit younger uh, who has new ideas, a new philosophy. And the word that I keep going back to, and when you talk about Chelsea, when you talk about Man City, you talk about um, Liverpool, you see the identity. Uh, ultimately, all these managers have an identity. Um, whether it's Man City, um, uh, Pep obviously has his clear philosophy, Klopp does, Sari does, and we need a manager who's going to come in and implement that and stick by it. And that's the, that's the point I think you're trying to make where Emery maybe doesn't have that. Or maybe he's still trying to figure that out. But that, that's what we need and that's the only thing really that's going to take us forward. Yep, absolutely. Guys, that brings us to the end of part two. We'll be back uh, in a minute with uh, part three, the third and final part of this season review. Cheers. Welcome back to the third and final part of our season review. Joining me, Mike Stavrou and James Cook uh, via video link. James, I'm going to start with you uh, on this segment. The big question is now, where do Arsenal go from here? What's the right move? How? What's the right approach? How would you go about uh, planning for next season? Great question. I think come the end of the season, the... Um the owners are going to sit down and have a look at what we've achieved, what we've done. Um, and I think, you know, ultimately this is a two-year project. Uh, Ralph Sinelli highlighted that an awful lot in his interview, that this is not a one but a two-year project. I think a lot of Arsenal fans at the start of the season were very sympathetic and very understanding that if it wasn't going to happen this season, then Emery's at least got next year in which to do it. I think with a bit more investment and getting the players in that he wants to, to, to play in the system that he's, he's used to, uh, maybe we'll see that identity come through. As I think you mentioned a little bit earlier on, I'm, I'm a bit concerned that we haven't really seen that philosophy just yet. I don't know any other manager in the top six that chops and changes as much as Emery does. It does, I don't want to say he's a little bit clueless at times, but I do have definite concerns that he, he is a little bit too pragmatic. Um, I mean, what I like about a Liverpool, for example, is that they've got a very settled team, a very settled defence, a very settled front three. But they do make those changes in midfield every so often where it's kind of a like for like. They'll take out Henderson, bring in Milner, maybe take out Fabinho, bring in Wijnaldum. And they've got a very good system of players that I think um, does work well. Here. And they've, they've all bought into the philosophy that Jurgen Klopp has installed in that Liverpool side. And as you mentioned before as well, I'd like to see a bit more coaching from... Emery, I want to see players improve significantly. I think the Liverpool model is a great one because they have brought in players like Robertson, like Wijnaldum, like Matip, that Klopp has taken from one level and brought them up another one. And I think it's fantastic the work he's done with some of those Liverpool players and then brought in financially, obviously he's been backed as well, that shouldn't go unnoticed, but they have then added the likes of Van Dijk, Salah, etc. And they've bought shrewdly as well. Salah, 35 million when they got him. I mean, his price must have about quadrupled now with what he's bought. And I think we've got to be quite similar in the transfer market because... Um, I think we've got to keep some of the players that we, we look to get rid of. As I mentioned before, I think Mustafi is going to be one of those players. Uh, Jacker, Kalasach, I don't see them going anytime soon, to be honest. Um, I do think that we're going to be looking at a team that consists of players from last season. And I do think we've got to be bringing in players that are, that are shrewd in the transfer market. I say that in the sense that we've got to be shrewd and we've got to bring in players the likes of Torreira that we can get for about 20, 25 million. If we could bring in about three or four of those players that might be gambles because we can't go out there and buy someone like a Kula Bali because we just don't have the funds to do it. So I'd say we've got to be shrewd in the transfer market. And I do think uh, we've, we've got to have faith in Emery because as Mike said, it's a brilliant comparison to someone like David Moyes. We're nowhere near uh, in, in, in that bad of a position. So I would, I would give him that other year. I don't want to be too rash with Emery. I'd let him have a few more players in that he wants. Um, and then that next hire that we're going to make for that manager position is, is crucial. I do think he has the potential to get us into the top four next season. I think we've got a great opportunity to do it. Chelsea look to be our closest competitors for it. And given their transfer ban, it, there's never been a better time for us to get into the top four. Um, I just think he's got to get some of those decisions right that he got wrong. Going back to Crystal Palace, playing a team that had so many changes in it was a massive wrong call. Uh, and I know I've mentioned it before, but it was a huge, huge turning point in this season. And um, if you can get rid of those poor decisions, bring in a couple of players that he wants to, then um, I would, I'd expect nothing less than for us to get a top four finish next season. Okay, interesting. Mike, how would you approach next season before I have my little say, my little rant on it? Because uh, I've got a very uh, different opinion. But go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, I go, I will go back to this word of identity, Harry. And the re reason I bring it up is because I think over the last five, six years, uh, the last few years of, of Wenger's reign, I think that's that's disappeared uh, somewhat. Um, whether that's through you know a clear philosophy of of what we are as a club, 
um, what we do on the pitch and what we do off the pitch and that has been lacking and for me the thing that has to come back is we need to be um, Arsenal again and I think we've we haven't really we've been missing as a as, as a club like what are we you you struggle to really say what what is Arsenal what defines Arsenal now and I just want to see a bit more of that back and I think one of the ways we can do that um, if we're not going to be able to go out and buy players that will improve the team because we got rid of the the one guy Sven Mistintat who could have gone out and found those bargains he's gone now uh, he he could have found us the likes of a Gwen who could who could come in at such a young age and and you know be part of the first team squad whatever you make of him that is um, so I think the only way to really get that sort of identity back is play some of the young players because there's nothing more as fans that you like to see is young players come in and do well like a Jack Wilshire you know never quite lived up to potential but we do have a few players in the academy which me and you go and watch that you know even if they don't get into the first team straight away they could play a part and I think that would reinvigorate fans a bit Harry and give us that identity back um, players like Reese Nelson he had a very good start to the season in the Bundesliga for Hoffenheim trailed off a bit which is fair enough but I think he could come in and definitely be part of the squad um, Emil Smith-Rowe he's struggled with injury and I think he needs another year of loan to be honest but he's one definitely for the future someone like Tyrese John Jules he's obviously unproven at, at the top level but what you do you play him in the Europa League and if he starts banging in goals and you bring him into the, into the first squad later in the season and that is what I want to see if we can't go out and spend big money on players then we need to try and bring through some of these young players that are hungry and have desire to play because what I saw in the last few years was players who who weren't fit enough to to wear the shirt they they don't care or whether it's a matter of that whether they're happy to just take their money what we need is a hunger back and um I, I think that's where we need to start that's the that's the key point for me so you're very much in favor of the approach of bringing in the youngsters and trying to find the rediscover the hunger and the identity of the club that way i've got a slightly different opinion and and james mentioned the need to be shrewd in the transfer market and i completely agree with that we know that Arsenal don't have the money. Um, you know, people will say we don't know what we've got to spend, but we know, come on, we do know that we're not going to go and spend 75 million on a centre back and things like that. So we know where our limitations are. Now, for me, I think of this in a little bit of a slightly different manner. I'm looking at the longer term future rather than just next season. And what I would say is perhaps. I may not fully back Unai Emery in this transfer window. And this probably sounds controversial and I'm going to get loads of abuse for this in the comments. But I would sit down as the owner and I would say to myself, right, let's have a look at what we've achieved this season. Now, the main thing and the main issue at Arsenal now is that we are stuck with players whose contracts are too big that we don't necessarily see as having a future at the club. Yet now we can't shift them. So would I go and give Unai Emery more money to go and get more players, potentially, that would be in the same situation. Players that are not fit for purpose, yet we're stuck with. And in my opinion, the signing of Stefan Lichsteiner was a complete balls up. 90 grand a week. I think that Socrates is okay, but is he a long-term uh, fixture in this Arsenal team? I don't think so. I think that Torreira started off really well, but is he going to improve at the rate that we need him to and quick enough I don't know um, that remains to be seen so for me I would be a little bit more cautious as the ownership and I know the fans don't want to hear this and as a fan I don't want this to happen but I think if I was responsible for the future of the club I'd be a little bit more cautious and I'd probably give Unai Emery till Christmas and then decide whether I think he's done enough to try and implement what it is he's trying to do and whether he's shown me that in actual fact he's worth backing because if he's not, I would cut my losses at Christmas, get him out the door and bring in someone else and try and move forward. I think people need to accept the fact that we may go through three, four, five, even six managers before we get to the right one. It isn't easy to replace someone who was there for 22 years, as Man United found out. And, and that's the point that you've made throughout the show. But I just think backing him with the maximum that the club has at the moment is a little bit irresponsible given that we haven't, in my opinion, seen enough to suggest that he is the right man. I, I don't know, James, have you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's a great point as well. Um, but I suppose people would say that we, we're not going to see the best out of this team until he's he's been backed properly. And if you give him, I don't know, if Stan Kroenke was to 
go crazy overnight and inject 200 million into this club and Emery could buy the players that he wanted to. I've got no doubts that you'd probably see a more uh, identifiable Arsenal. You'd see a philosophy in place and you'd see, you, you would hope to see a better style of football. Um, but I think given the situation we're in, where we've got limited funds and we're one of the only clubs in the world that's completely self-sustaining in the top six, which is mental. Um, I, I think uh, the club won't give him all the funds that, that he wants. And I do think they'll probably give him a portion of that transfer kitty to bring in players that I think we need. So I do think he'll, he'll have the funds to bring in wide players and hopefully a centre-half as well because we desperately need that. But apart from that, I don't think the club are going to release all the funds that are available to us. Of course, throughout the, throughout the season, we're going to generate revenue. Um, and if we do bring in player sales, then that's a bit more transfer kitty that we've got. And there will be money there next summer as well. And Stan Kroenke always has the option to put in money to this club because, as I say, we're self-sustaining and he's not put a penny into Arsenal yet. So he, we do have that option if uh, the tide was to turn. Um, and then Kroenke was willing to put a bit of his own uh, personal cash into, into Arsenal. Um, so I, I don't think we're, we're going to be in a situation where we see Arsenal spend a lot of money. Uh, I think we'll see us be shrewd. As I say, I think we're looking at Arsenal bringing in a couple of the young players. So Willock's had a lot of chances in the first team this season. I say a lot. He's had quite a few limited chances. But when he has played, he has played well. We'll see a few of the players like Reese Nelson, Smith Rowe come through into the team, I think. And then I think on top of that, Emery will be given probably a maximum of 50 million. Um, possibly. I'm not too sure. I, I, honestly, I can't put a figure on how much we're going to have to spend. I think... It's all it's all objective, and we're gonna to have to to wait and see how it pans out. But I don't think, in answer to your question, the club are gonna release all the money that we've got available to him if they're not a hundred percent certain that he's the right man. Absolutely, Mike. Your response to that? <laughs> um, yeah, I get where you're coming from, Harry. Firstly, I just think we don't we don't have that money. Like, it's not like we're gonna say, all right, you know, here's hundred million. I don't think. I, but I, but, I don't but think if there was seventy million, yeah. Do you think that Unai would get all 70? Of well, that I mean? think it's a bit of a catch-22 because um, ultimately, if you want a manager to um, to implement his philosophy, you need the right players. And I know what you mean in the sense of like we, we haven't seen what it is and it is quite confused what his, what his own uh, brand is, right? But if you don't give him the players, then we're just going to be stuck in the exact same uh, situation that, that we are. Um, so... It is a catch-22, as, as I say. You know, having to put square pegs in round holes, which is what we've had to do this season. Emery wants to play a, the four-two-three-one. We don't have wingers, so, so we've had to switch it to to a three-back where where Aubameyang and Lacazette play in a two. I mean, that's not what he wants to play. So I do understand where you're coming from. I just question whether are you going to keep going round and round? Like, do we give him the money or, or do we not? If we do... Is he going to be able to change things? Is is he not? I mean, that's a question for the for the uh, for the owner to decide. And a lot of people talk about Stan Kroenke, and he hasn't invested a lot of money. I mean, the f- people don't. What some people don't understand is that the way the FFP works is you can't spend more money than than you have. And ultimately, the the way that our club is run, and with the mess that we've been in with the with the players like running out of con- contracts and not getting any transfer fees in and um and the the wage structure it means that even if uh, Kroenke was to invest loads of money we wouldn't be able to spend it anyway and you know I know that Man City weren't one of the only ones to circumvent them rules and I don't think they'll get away with it by the way I think they'll be out of the Champions League next season um it it doesn't really work like that so you know I, I understand your point but I don't necessarily agree that's I the just way. I just don't know whether giving him everything that we have is the responsible move, given that he's not shown me, me personally, and now this is just my view, this is not fact, or this is just my opinion. He hasn't shown enough to show that we should back his horse, that we should lay down everything on the table, because if we do that, and the next season we miss out on the top four again, and we don't make the Champions League, then for me, Unai Emery has to go. But then if you get rid of Unai Emery, but you've spent a fortune on another, a second group of players who aren't fit for purpose, then you've got a problem. And I I would just think that if you were to review this season and take into account all the points that we've made throughout this show about, you know, the disappointment, the way it ended, the lack of philosophy, etc. I just think it would be silly to, to put all your eggs in Unai Emery's basket this summer I get what you're saying, that he needs the players to to be able to play his way to implement his style. But you should still be able to see the blueprint. You should still be able to see the outline of what it is that he's trying to do. And for me, I can't. 
Who would you? The, the, the issue is obviously at at that point where we were looking for Wenger's replacement, um, that should have been planned better. I think. I mean, was Unai Emery the right guy given his track record? All right, he'd won you know three European Cups with Sevilla, but you know that's not elite, is it? Uh, at, at PSG, he was tasked with winning the Champions League. Obviously, didn't do that. Fell out with big players like Neymar, um, and like are underachieved ultimately so was he the right man in the first place you can ask but also you have to say who could we have attracted that would have done a better job do you think someone like Arteta would, would have done a better job right now I, I think that you it's very difficult to say because obviously hindsight is a wonderful thing and to to predict how someone would do you know is impossible because you don't know all the circumstances but and I'm not necessarily against the fact that we appointed Dunai Emery we've done it We've tried it out. For me, it's not worked. You know, if he gets in the top four this uh, next season, then he would have met probably the board's expectations and he'll probably get more time, and that's fine by them. But my point has always been that expectations are just throughout a season. And this season, we had a glorious opportunity, not once but twice, to get in the Champions League. So as far as I'm concerned, his failure to do that is a failure yeah the only issue I've, i have of that harry is that look well not ultimately the the state that we're in we're not going to get an elite manager right we can rule that out we're, we're not going to get the likes of a diego simeone if he was to leave um a max allegra he'd want too much money so we're shopping in that mid-range market which is where Unai Emery is the only other option is to get someone younger like arteta or someone of that ilk maybe like a julian nagelsman who's slightly higher and further on in his career but if you do that you have to accept that it's going to be a long haul. And fans, especially Arsenal fans, given the absolute outrage at this season's results, I mean, it'd be even worse if you get someone like that because ultimately they're very young in their coaching career. They don't have much experience. You can expect maybe for us to drop below the likes of the Wolves and the Leicesters, maybe into about an eighth, ninth position. And that might carry on for a while, especially if he doesn't get backed. So I think fans need to sort of make a decision in that sense what they want. Do they want someone to sustain us and keep us competitive, which Unai Emery is almost doing. All right, he didn't quite achieve it this season, but next season he could. Or do you want to give time and patience? Because let's be honest, Arsenal fans are not a patient bunch. No, I agree. Uh, James, uh, how do you see that one? For me, uh, you know, I would accept a, a little bit of time, uh, you know, where we're out of the top four, if I could see the long-term plan. I, and I know that I don't speak for all Arsenal fans when I say that. I'm talking my own personal view, but wh where do you stand on that? Would you take sort of dropping out of the top six potentially for a couple of years to give someone a chance to build us up from scratch or or do you think that it is we're going to just have to keep chopping and changing the likes of Unai Emery and people around his sort of bracket and hoping that that's enough to keep us there or thereabouts look in this day and age you don't really have the time to let someone bed in um, and you, you can't really say look we're going to sacrifice three or four years outside the top four so long as you get it right on the fifth year that's that's just not going to happen um, there's so much money in the game at the minute that getting those top places is essential and I just don't think that Arsenal as a franchise are going to be willing to do that I don't think any real top six club are going to be wanting to do that everyone wants immediate success and unfortunately there's no patience in football anymore so I don't think that's realistically an option I do think the club is going to have to you know put their eggs in it's sort of in, in one basket with Emery. I don't know if you've seen the interview that Vinay and Rousselli have done on YouTube where they talk in depth about the appointment of Emery, about letting Ramsey and Welbeck go for free, about the situation of the club, etc, etc. Where they talk pretty much about everything that Arsenal fans want to hear, which is, is great from their point of view. I don't know how much of it is true or not, but it does seem like a load of hot air to me. Um, but they do talk sort of in depth about how much faith they've got in Unai Emery. And if they're going to put their money where their mouth is, I know it's not their money, but they've got the power in which to do it. If they want to fully back this guy and give him the finances to do it, if they've got as much faith in him as they say, then they will give him that money in the summer to invest to build his own philosophy. I do think we're in an era now where, I mean, I don't think I kind of know that we're in an era where there's only real limits to managers where it's about two or three years at a time. I think uh, Klopp is even an, an exception to that at the minute where he's been in the job at Liverpool um, for about four or five years now. And uh, that's that, that's great from their point of view because they've got an identity and why would you want to get rid of someone like Klopp, especially whilst it's working? On that side, though, I do think it makes sense that um, they it took them a couple of years to really get going. Uh, of course, they got into the Europa League final in Klopp's early days. They lost that and... You could see significant improvement in that Liverpool side, which I think was really, really encouraging. And then they, they got back into the top four 
in a couple of years. If Emery can do it in this second season, um, and if we, we see significant improvement, then we might eat our words about what we're saying about him right now. So I think it's definitely something that's going to prevail over time. Um, but from what I've seen this season, it's the decisions that he's made that have really cost him at times. Um, but if we can learn from, from what Klopp's done, I think it's important that we give Emery a bit more time and don't be rash in this instance and hopefully uh, we'll we'll see significant improvement James, throughout I see the course what, next what season. what you say there, but I think the, the, the sort of obvious comparison between Emery and Klopp is that Klopp w- was a winner. I mean, he'd won the, the, the German league against all odds, um, got into a Champions League final. Uh, he was a proven manager with a proven track record. Emery doesn't have that at that level. So I think, you know, we, we need to take that into consideration. The reason uh, Liverpool were willing to back Klopp is because they knew eventually the plan was going to prevail. And it has. They won the Champions League, but they did go through a few years of, um, of turmoil, really. You know, when, when you look at how much money they spent. I'd call the, it the transition, transition rather than turmoil. But I, I don't think uh, Emery's at that level. So I think al- although you do have to have patience, as Harry says, you need to see what he's done and the blueprint, which is obviously not quite there and make that decision. But as, as I say before, it's such a difficult situation because we're not in the position that Liverpool are. We don't have that sort of money. And at, at the moment, I don't think we can attract that sort of manager like Klopp or, or, or someone of a similar ilk to be able to come in and do that job. Great points made by everybody. And uh, guys, unfortunately, we're going to have to call it a day. That brings us to the end of our season review show. But is, there is a long summer ahead. There's lots to discuss. There's lots to dissect. So we'll be back throughout the summer with more content looking back on last season what went wrong what went well uh, and looking uh, at the way forward for our beloved football club Uh, James thank you very much for joining us mate do you want to let our listeners know how they can uh, find your YouTube channel and follow you on social media yeah of course thanks for having me on Harry and um, great to chat with yourself and Mike this afternoon Um, you can find me on Twitter at JECook96 and on YouTube AFC Game by Game great stuff thank you very much James Mike do you want to let people know how they can follow you yeah on Twitter it's um, Mike underscore Stabru for those of you who aren't Greek and probably struggle to <laughs> pronounce that let alone spell it it's uh, Mike underscore S-T-A-V-R-O-U on Twitter yeah that's that's one of the easier Greek names to be fair I've yeah. got to say uh, guys don't forget to follow us at Chronicles underscore AFC subscribe to this channel hit the little bell icon as well for a notification every time we upload of course this show is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Spotify, and all the usual podcast uh, stores too. If you're watching the video, hit the like button uh, and leave us a comment below. Thanks very much, and we'll be back very, very soon.